All right, welcome to the Decred Roundtable Episode 4. You know, you might notice right off the bat that this is not a live stream. So we're experimenting a little bit. We decided to pre-record this episode to see how it turns out. Hopefully we'll be able to push out some higher quality content doing this, doing it this way. But there still is that issue that you can't ask live questions. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to post them in the YouTube comments. Be sure to get to them or come hang out with us on Slack. There's now an official Decred Roundtable uh, Slack channel, so you can come leave feedback, uh, post any questions you have, and we'll be sure to answer them. All right, well, let's get to the show. First up is the Decred Rundown. So what's been happening the past two weeks in Decred? Well, uh, one big announcement is the new Decred Slate has been launched. So Decred.org got a complete redesign, and it looks great. You know, not only did the front page get redesigned, but some new pages have also been added, like the contributors page. So go check it out. You know, I think this was a common question that newcomers had. You know, where's your, your team page? So now you can go and check out all the Decred contractors and you can see if they work for a specific company like Company Zero or if they're just a contractor on their own. Next up is the Lightning Network. So I wanted to clear up some confusion about what exactly is going to be activated in a couple of days. The changes that we voted on and that are in the lock-in phase right now are the changes required to make Decred compatible with the Lightning Network. So it's not the actual Lightning Network implementation itself, although that is being worked on and there is a lot of effort going being directed at that Lightning Network implementation. We're just gonna have to be patient and wait and see how it gets rolled out over the next couple of months. So the last uh, announcement I wanted to make is that uh, the Plydia Challenge deadline has been extended to the end of January. So this is just to give the teams working on projects some extra time during the holiday season to really refine their ideas. So that's all we got for the Decred Roundup. Um, the next segment of the show is something a little bit new. It's a technical breakdown of Plydia. So this is aimed at a non-technical audience. You know, I wanted to help the Decred community really understand what Polydia is. So if you have no idea what a hash function is or what a Merkle tree is, stay tuned because you're gonna learn about all of that and how it fits into DCR time and Polydia. So let me know what you think about this new type of technical breakdown segment. If you guys like it, I'll do some more of them, you know, maybe one for Lightning Network. The question that we're trying to answer is, how do we go about storing and managing the proposals that people submit? Let's say that somebody submits a proposal, then a week later, before it gets voted on, they want to incorporate some feedback from the community, so they decide to make some changes to it. You know, this shouldn't be a big deal, but we want to make sure that each version of the proposal is stored in a safe manner, and that anyone can go in and look at how a proposal changed over time. For this type of version control, the developers decided to use an open source tool called Git. Git is widely used among the software development community for version control of code bases. Instead of building a version control solution from the ground up, we're taking advantage of mature open source technology. I'll show you how it works. So what you're looking at right now is a website called GitHub. GitHub allows you to store files that you're tracking with Git, and it also has a nice UI to view all the changes that Git tracks. So I'm going to use it to demonstrate some concepts to you guys. Every time you make a new version of a document, it's called a Git commit. You'll see here that I have three different commits. I started out with an initial version of the proposal, and then I changed it a few times to make a total of three different versions. Let's take a look at the first version. What you'll see here is that the first version of the proposal only has three lines of text. I'm trying to get funding for these Decred Roundtable episodes, and I think I'll need a million DCR to do it. Well, the community wasn't down with this. You know, they thought it was too expensive, and I can't really blame them, so I decided to make a new version of the proposal and lower the funding amount. In this second version of the proposal, I'm only requesting 100 DCR, which seems much more reasonable. If you take a look at the actual proposal, you can see the changes that Git is tracking. The line highlighted in red means that line was removed, and the line highlighted in green means that line was added. Even though I adjusted the funding amount in this second version of the proposal, I still got some pushback from the community saying that I needed project milestones in order to get paid. So I created one more version of the proposal that includes a milestone payment after two roundtable episodes have been aired. So obviously these are not real proposals, they're just being used to demonstrate what Git does, but there is one problem with using just Git to track proposals. The Git commit timestamps can be altered with a single command. I'll show you. If I run this command, I can change the timestamp to be whatever I want. In this case, I changed it to January 1st, 2018. This means that a malicious person could have a proposal funded, then go back and make a change to the proposal after the vote and change the timestamp to make it look like 
his changes were introduced before the vote. You know, this is not good. We want to be able to cryptographically prove exactly what was voted on and ensure that the document was not altered in any way. We could store all the proposals on the actual Decred blockchain, but that would cause the blockchain to start growing at a tremendous rate and lead to blockchain bloat. The larger a blockchain is, the more expensive it becomes to run a full node. If your blockchain is 5 terabytes, you're severely limiting the number of people in the world who will be able to run full nodes. This means that Decred would become less decentralized and thus less secure. So we want to find a way to cryptographically verify the authenticity of these documents without actually having to store them on chain. As a solution, the developers built a tool called DCR Time. DCR Time is based off of a project called Open Timestamps, which is built by a Bitcoin Core developer named Peter Todd. The purpose of Open Timestamps and DCR Time is to be able to verify the authenticity of documents using the blockchain without actually having to store those documents on the blockchain. In order to understand how this works, we're going to need to dive into some cryptography basics. So first up is a hash function. So a hash function is just a function that takes an arbitrary size of data and maps it to a fixed size of data. So you may have also heard these referred to as hash algorithms, hashing algorithms, um, they're all the same thing. So basically you have an input and you have an output. The input can be however big or small you want, but the output will always be the same size. The input is called a message and the output is called a hash. In the case of the SHA-256 hash function, the hash is always going to be 64 characters long. So whether your input message is just a single word like hello, or if it's an entire text file with pages and pages and pages of text, the output, aka the hash, is always going to be 64 characters long. Cryptographic hash functions are a special kind of hash function that have some specific properties that make them useful to us. So we're going to run through what those properties are. The first property is that they're deterministic. So this just means that the same input message will always result in the same output hash. If I run the word hello through a hash function, the output is always going to be the same. The second property is that these cryptographic hash functions are one way. So this is really important. This just means that it's infeasible to take that output hash and to figure out what the input message was from just looking at that hash. You know, you can only go one way. You can go from input to output. You can't go from output and figure out what the input was. The third property is that if you make any changes to the input message, no matter how small, even if you just add a single period, the output hash is going to be a completely new value that is uncorrelated with the old value. So if you run the message hello through a hash algorithm, you're going to get one hash value. And then if you run the message hello period through that same hash function, you're going to get a completely new hash value that is uncorrelated with the old one. The last property that we're going to talk about is collisions. So cryptographic hash functions do not have collisions. A collision would be if you have two different input messages like hello and goodbye, and then they had the same output hash. That would be a collision and that would be bad. So, um, you know, good cryptographic hash functions don't have collisions. Now you might be asking, well, if there's an infinite number of inputs because the input size can be anything and there's a finite number of output values because the output size is fixed, then there has to be some collisions at some point. And well, you'd be correct in thinking of this, but the numbers involved are so enormous that actually finding a collision isn't believed to be physically possible. So that's what a hash function is. Um, it takes a variable size input and turns it into a fixed size output. Next up, we're gonna take a look at Merkle trees. So a Merkle tree is a type of data structure that is used for efficiently summarizing and verifying the integrity of large sets of data. You know, so that probably didn't mean very much to you, so let's break it down a little bit. In our situation, we want to be able to verify the authenticity of documents without actually having to store those documents on the blockchain. We can use a Merkle tree to do this. Let's assume that we have four different documents and then at some point down the road, we'll need to verify that these documents have not been altered. We can do this by creating a Merkle tree out of the documents and then taking what's called the Merkle root and including the Merkle root in a Decred transaction. Let's run through exactly how this would happen. The first thing we would need to do is turn each of the four documents into a hash. We now have four hashes. I'll refer to these as hash A, hash B, hash C, and hash D. Remember, a hash is just a string of letters and numbers. In this case, it's 64 letters and numbers all back to back without any spaces in between. The next step is to combine hash A with hash B to create a single 128 character long string, then run that 128 character long string through the hash function again. 
This is gonna output a new 64 character long hash that we'll call hash AB since it's the product of hash A and hash B. We're gonna do the same thing for hash C and hash D. We combine them, run them through the hash function again to create hash CD. We've now turned four hashes into two hashes. We're gonna go through this process one more time in order to turn two hashes into just one hash. So we combine hash A and B with hash B and C, then we run this combination through the hash function and we're left with hash A, B, C, D. We just took four documents and through the process of repeatedly hashing them down, we created a single hash called a Merkle root. This is important because if any of the documents change at all, even if there's just a single period added to just one of the documents, the hash of that document will change and that will cascade throughout the entire Merkle tree structure, which ultimately means that the Merkle root is gonna be different. For example, let's say that we make a minor change to document one. That means that hash A is now gonna be different, which will cause hash AB to be different, which will cause hash ABCD to be different, and hash ABCD is our Merkle root. So going back to our original example, if we wanna verify the authenticity of those four documents at some point later down the road, we can use the documents to create a Merkle tree, then take that Merkle root and include it in a decred transaction so that our Merkle root is now permanently stamped on the decred blockchain. We can go back and reference it anytime we want. So all that we have to do to verify that none of the documents have been altered is to create a new Merkle tree with them, then compare that Merkle root that you get with the Merkle root that is embedded on the decred blockchain. If both Merkle roots are the same, you can confidently say that none of the four documents have been altered. If even a single letter has been changed in any of the documents, the Merkle roots will not be the same and you'll know. So you may be wondering, well, even if we know what block our Merkle root is in, how do we know the date and time of that block? The answer is that each block is required to have a timestamp in order for it to be valid. So exactly how accurate this timestamp must be is a complex topic, but for our purposes, it's fair to say that it will likely be accurate to within two to three hours and almost certainly within a day. So we'll be able to correlate the block that we stamped our Merkle root with, with a specific date and a rough time frame. Now that you understand hash functions and Merkle trees, let's circle back to DCR time. So there's two components to DCR time, the client and the server. If I want to timestamp a document, I would use the T DCR time client to convert that document into a hash and then send that hash up to a specified DCR time server. You know, a DCR time server is a centralized server managed by either a specific person or a group of people or a company. So for the proposal system, Decred will have its own DCR time server. The server's job is to listen for these hashes that are sent to it, and then every hour on the hour, the server will compile all the hashes that it has pending, turn those hashes into a Merkle tree, and then take the Merkle root and include it in a decred transaction, thus anchoring the Merkle root onto the decred blockchain. If at a later date I want to check the document's authenticity and make sure it hasn't been changed, the DCR time client will grab the required Merkle tree information from the DCR time server and verify whether or not my document has been altered. So tying this all back together, Plydia can be described as Git with cryptographic timestamping. Proposals will be stored using Git repositories on centralized servers, so this is not a decentralized storage system like SIA or Filecoin, but each version of each proposal is gonna be timestamped using DCR time. So it's gonna go through that process that we talked about, about converting you know, the, the document into a hash, using that hash to build a Merkle tree, and then stamping the Merkle root from that Merkle tree onto the Decred blockchain. So that the authenticity of each version of each proposal is cryptographically verifiable. All right, so now that you guys hopefully have a better understanding of what Polydia is, let's talk with Jaco Compiat about some potential Polydia use cases. Joining me right now is Jaco Compiat, CEO of Company Zero and Decred Project Organizer. Thanks for taking the time to answer some of our questions. Thanks for having me, Luke. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, to be on the show. Sweet. All right, we'll just dive right in then. So hopefully the audience has a better understanding of what Polydia is. So building on that a little bit, what are some use cases for Polydia besides the Decred proposal system? Um, some use cases for Politea are, um, well, okay, so maybe I'll do a very short review of, of what we're doing here. The, the system allows you to do uh, dual-sided attestation of, uh, you know, basically speech. 
And this, this has a number of uses. In our case, we use it for the proposal system. So people submit proposals, admins pro pro uh, will uh, review proposals, and then ultimately the proposals become public information so that everybody can sort of you know, comment on them and participate in them with them. The way is some other examples of, of what Politeo would be used for is that it would be used in other scenarios where you want this dual-sided attestation. Um, one example would be um, the example of college degrees. So in the case of, you know, in the case that we care about, we care about proposals and we care about whether they're public or not or who submitted them or whether they have bad information in them. In the case of college degrees, people care about whether the degree is valid, whether it was issued by the, uh, you know, by the educational institution that we, you know, where it's claimed it's from, and so on. So, um, currently, the way that works is that you know you just claim your oh I graduated from University X, and then you you know you're supposed to take people's word on it. The way it would work in in our example is is that instead of uh, receiving a diploma as a piece of paper, you would receive a diploma that's basically a proposal that has been signed by school administrators. And then you can publicly verify that this thing exists without necessarily showing everyone's diploma. For example, you can take the diploma, all of the data that's in the diploma, hash it down, and then sign that. You sign that, you know, a school administrator signs that to go, you know, J Jake took these courses here during this period of time and he received these grades. And then they can submit it into the system and then somebody can approve it and go, okay, we've reviewed this report card, it's valid, it's legit. So you have a sort of a series of, of, of report cards or grades anchored into a chain that's been attested to by the university, then those things taken in aggregate basically comprise a degree. So your degree is a series of these files that you take, you hash down, and then you can present the bundle of all of your grades, your whole, your whole diploma basically to your employer, and then your employer can verify it with the university that has the bottom, the Merkle root of the, uh, you know, of this information public. So that there's no real information bled about you publicly uh, that people, random people can see. But if you show your employer your, uh, you know, your diploma, your diploma is a series of, uh, you know, pieces of data that are stored on this, stored on this chain and anchored. You can then check with the university's copy of Politea to see that the degree is valid. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it seems like, you know, anytime you need to verify the authenticity of documents, like this would be a good system to put in place. Exactly. I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the nuts and the bolts of what Politea does is that it allows you to attest that data existed on or before a certain date by a certain identity. So awesome. in this case, you know, in the case of the degrees, the identity is that basically the university as an organization is attesting to the fact that you went there and you did indeed receive these grades and pay for these courses. Yeah, exactly. Um, so one big part of Politea is the timestamping functionality of DCR time, you know, which is based on Peter Todd's open timestamps. You know, and Peter Todd has suggested some use cases for this type of timestamping. You know, one example is turning the content of a website into a timestamp so that you can prove uh, certain content existed on a specific website at a certain at a particular point in time. You know, kind of like similar to uh, what we were just talking about with the uh, college degrees. So do you do any other timestamping use cases come to mind for DCR time? I've actually discussed this a little bit with uh, with Marco Piraboom, uh, you know, the, the person I, I sort of made all of this work with. And the, the conclusion that we've come to is, is that DCR time is actually a very narrow tool. If you ask in detail what DCR time does, DCR time is, it, it, it provides a very narrow function. By anchoring timestamps of data into the blockchain, what you can do is you can demonstrate that a certain piece of data existed on or before the date of the timestamp according to, you know, and typically it's a, associated with an identity that I was mentioning before. So DCR time has a very narrow application and is a narrow tool. However, how you, you, you know, how you choose to apply the identity and which information you're anchoring, there's a huge amount of flexibility in terms of what goes into that. So this was also, you know, this is also our motivation in saying that this is a very generic tool. You can use it to do dozens of things. And I think that, you know, from, from an anchoring perspective, it's a very narrow statement. I mean, even the statement that you can say that a certain piece of information was on a certain website at a certain time, the question becomes who is attesting to that? Is the a website itself attesting to that or is an external party attesting the, to that? So for example, I can claim that, oh, I saw some really crazy racist stuff on Twitter at some time of the day. I can claim that, I can take that information and just stuff it into 
Politea, and then there will be a timestamp that says, Jake said that there, is, there was this information on a website at a certain time. So who is attesting to this information existing at a certain time is really quite important here. So I yeah, feel like you know, a generic external website, you can't really prove that they had anything up. You can, you can say that you can say that they had, uh, you know, that some information was anchored in the chain, but who, who is stamping it really matters. Yeah, so Plitea or Plitea basically takes that, that open timestamp functionality and just makes it a whole lot more useful. Um, cool, so these, uh, these technologies are open source, right? If people decide to use you know, Plitea or DCR time, they'll be using the Decred blockchain without actually having to purchase any Decred. So do you see these use cases as actually adding value to the Decred ecosystem? Most definitely, I mean, I feel like what we have to remember about cryptocurrencies is, is that the notion of value in the context of a cryptocurrency is really all about network. It's just like any other organization. The larger your network, the more value there is in it, whether we're talking per, you know, perception or mind share or whatever. And um, by, 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 bu by building technology that we then give away so that people can use it without necessarily investing directly in the, in the Decred ecosystem, we, we build a link between us and businesses and organizations that would otherwise probably not even consider looking at Decred. But because they get this really useful tool for free, they may decide to go, well, you know, you guys made Politea. We've, we've basically gotten, you know, thousands or millions of dollars of free technology out of this and, you know, streamlined our internal operations. Maybe we should have a look at the underlying currency that powers this. So that's sort of, you know, that, that's our idea with, with, Politea from a as a more general tool. We obviously want to use it, but once we started talking about the kind of system we wanted to design for our governance, we thought, wow, this would be super useful in so many other places. And what we're hoping is is that that utility acts as essentially a marketing tool. So people, you know, implement this, they they roll it out in their in their own uh, company. They go, wow, this is super useful. Maybe I should check out what else these you know these guys are doing. Yeah, it, you know, giving away this free technology seems like a great way to try and jumpstart like viral um, word of mouth kind of uh, spreading of decred. So, and it also, you know, once somebody starts using uh, their own instance of Plitea or DCR time for timestamping, right? They now have a vested interest in the decred blockchain actually, you know, continuing on and surviving because it's, you know, they're they're anchoring their data to the decred blockchain. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It, even though they're not actually required to purchase decred, it still adds a whole lot of value to the decred ecosystem as a whole. Um, and okay, so lastly, um, I wanted to talk about the Plitea, ch Plitea challenge. So this is a contest that Decred is running right now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it and what the motivations were behind it? Yeah, the I, you know the the motivation with the Politea challenge is just like I've stated uh, earlier that Politea is an extremely generic tool. It's effectively a git. It, it's a it, it's a Git repository with uh, blockchain timestamp anchoring. And that is a really, it's just a very generic tool, as I pointed out. We could use it for, you know, college degrees. We could use it in all kinds of medical contexts that, you know, you, t that, you know, a medical facility attests that you took an x-ray at a certain time of day. There's so many, or, you know, it could be government document storage. There's so many potential applications for this that realistically, we don't have time to go through and help everybody implement them. So we're really building it for ourselves, but we're trying to keep it generic enough so that tons of people can use it. And the challenge is basically us incentivizing people to come and participate and, uh, you know, figure out a way to integrate Politea with their system and, uh, and then also to engage with us. You know, we're really looking for development talent and Politea has already, prior to this competition, drawn several people out of the woodwork who are now, you know, committing and contributing to the repository. So the real goal with the Politea challenge is, is to engage more development talent. But, you know, at a, at a, you know, on another level, we're just trying to sort of spread the technology around because we think it's extremely useful and a whole bunch of people can get a lot of utility out of it. And then they don't really even have to pay us. They can just sort of take the tools that we've been using and we've designed and pick them up and start using them and hacking. So that's really where we're going with the Politea Challenge. We're trying to, uh, you know, draw a mind share from existing developers and have them come take a look at our products. And when, when's the end date of the Politea, Politea Challenge? 
We've actually moved the end date, and, the re and there, there's a few justifications for this. We were originally going to have a party and the, you know, award the prize on December 1st, but basically what we've seen uh, based on announcing the challenge and you know, only a few people saying that they were going to submit something was that you know, we didn't really give people enough time to uh, hack up their own solution. The, we, there's a number of things that we figure sort of factor into this is that in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, there's big Christian and, you know, all other religious holidays during the colder months. So during that time, people just aren't as productive. People have family commitments. Oh, I got to travel here. Oh, I got to go see mom or dad or whatever. And that, you know, really sort of slows down most people's work output. So we figured, you know, in light of that, that we were like, oh, there's not quite enough interest to turn it around this quickly. We're going to delay it until January 20, sometime between the 26th and the 28th. And uh, that way people have like basically winter break or some cold weeks to uh, work on everything. And I'm sorry if that doesn't apply if, if, you, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, but I think 90% of us live in the Northern Hemisphere. So I'm just, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going with the numbers here. And, uh, yeah. you know, that, that's, uh, you know, in terms of when this is going to end, it's going to end, uh, in late January and then we'll announce the winner, uh, then. Great. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. You know, over holiday breaks is typically when people really have time to like dive into these type of things. So, um, I'm excited to see what people come up with, but, um, that, that wraps up our interview with Jake Oak and Pyatt. Again, thanks for taking the time to answer some questions. Thanks Luke. Thanks for having me. All right, welcome to the roundtable discussion segment of the show. Joining me today, we have Nick B from the marketing team. Thanks for joining us tonight, Nick. Glad to be here again, man. It's great. Yeah. So the the roundtable discussions are usually a little bit bigger, but there are a lot of scheduling conflicts this week. So um, you know, in coming weeks, we should have more members of the Decred ecosystem and community on here as well. But tonight, we've got a couple of topics to talk about. Um, the first one is, well, everybody just watched the, the Plydia technical breakdown and the interview with Jake about some of the use cases. So did you have uh, anything you wanted to add to that discussion? I know one thing that we didn't hit on was some of the motivations, original motivations for creating Plydia. Yeah. Um so while I was uh, doing my research on like what it is and and, and how does it work, um, also wanted to look into like well why are they building it and what's the purpose of it. And so um, what I found was like uh, basically integrate it basically is integrating a community based uh, government system right into the blockchain, right? And so what's the purpose of that? Well, you know it can kind of ensure protections uh, for like sustainable and fair um, like growth of the project. Um, you know, got into like new ideas, um, you know, kind of combat censorship, uh, and hopefully it just promotes transparency uh, as to like yeah. the direction of where the project can go. Um, and so all of that is like, sounds, sounds, sounds fantastic, right? Because with all these competing ideas in a decentralized project, you know, things can get buried, things, you know, things can get very, uh, there's, there could be a lot of turmoil. I mean, uh, so it's great that they're doing this to build a system so that it can help, uh, um, you know, shine light and and give like uh, um, a way of like solving clashing views or and in, in getting uh, you know coming to an impasse basically. Definitely, and I think like the transparency aspect is key, right? It it provides a way uh, a cryptographic cryptographically verifiable way to you know make sure documents were altered and that everything is transparent and by the book. So did you have any use cases that came to mind when you were kind of thinking more about Plydia and you know its applications? Yeah, so um, it was cool to find out that uh, Plydia was also um, uh, being built for for like uh, public and private use as well. And and so there's a little bit of discussions in the Slack group community uh, throwing out some ideas on what it could potentially be used for. And so I did some looking myself. Uh, and so I was thinking I have a couple of things. So uh, keeping in mind that um, like Palladia is like a document and records like storage kind of system. So what, what kinds of things can you do with that? And I remembered um, a couple of things uh, in the, recently. So one of the things was a few years ago when Brazil's uh, hosting the Olympics. While they were while they were building the infrastructure to host the Olympics, um, there was unfortunately a number of people that were had to be displaced because they were living on land um, that they thought they had owned, but was there were no records of it. And so um, 
um, you know, maybe having like some kind of like timestamp system where you can secure um, some kind of land ownership documentation can help, I, I guess, avoid that. Another thing was uh, uh, a number of years ago in Haiti when that uh, they had uh, that big earthquake, their infrastructure was hit really hard and they lost a whole bunch of records, again, tied to like land rights. And so they had to kind of like rebuild everything and, and figure out like who owns what. And, and that was kind of a huge mess for them. So um, something, you know, for a country that can't really secure th these kinds of documents uh, in a way that, you know, can survive natural disasters or anything like that. You know, I, I don't know, I was thinking like maybe Palencia could be, or uh, NTCR time could be used uh, to secure these kinds of documents. Yeah, I think one of the, yeah, one of the biggest applications is gonna be just government documents, right? So the document, or the first step for, I guess, countries like Haiti would be first digitizing their documents, um, but then being able to, you know, verify their authenticity is gonna be very important down the road, right? Once yeah. everything is digital, um, you know, you'll, they'll still be stored in, on like central servers, but you can, back those servers up like very easily in like different countries just using AWS. So that shouldn't be like an issue. And yeah, well, I think just Plydia is built for governance. And so it moving to the actual, you know, nation state and state and local government structures, I think is, you know, a logical next step. Yeah, um, there is another thing too. So um, speaking from personal experience, um, I was thinking like, um, whenever I buy um, electronics online, uh, you know, usually there's like some kind of mailing uh, rebate. Uh, so when, when you purchase it, you, you get the product and then you have to like, usually like cut out a barcode, you know, download and print out and fill out a form, put that all together, mail it out. And usually there's a short time frame uh, for you to uh, get reimbursed for this mailing rebate. You know, sometimes it could be a week, sometimes it could be a month. and for me, I usually don't do any of that stuff until like a week or two later because I'm too busy enjoying my new piece of equipment. So I was thinking like, oh, wouldn't it be great if there was a way that uh, I can kind of get that documentation, you know, verify that I bought the product, verify the serial number of the product, and then like timestamp that somehow so that the uh, manufacturer knows that, you know, I did submit my, re my rebate on time. Because I've had mail-in rebates that were rejected because they were received outside of the time uh, window. Um, and what do you think of that's, that? That's interesting. Um, so yeah, I hadn't really thought of like a use case like that before, but I think that's a good point is anytime a company is required to store a date for you, you know, that is of some value down the road, I think that would be a great application for DCR time, right? Because, you know, you hope that they're storing that date in a safe manner, but you know, you don't know their data security practices. And then there is the incentive that, um, like the incentive does exist for them to change it in certain scenarios. Like you would hope that they would never do something like that, like commit fraud, but I'm sure it's happened before. And so just creating, uh, using DCR time to make sure that that is not even possible, I think would really benefit a lot of companies or it would benefit consumers. I don't know how happy companies would be about it, but yeah, I think that's a, that's another interesting that's, use case. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, you know, I, it kind of is like, it kind of seems that these rebate um, uh, processes are built this way so that it kind of discourages people from fulfilling it and, you know, and getting reimbursed, but I don't know who knows. And then, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just say it reminds me of like in the grocery store, you'll see like, satisfaction guaranteed or your money back will like nobody ever actually will send like go through the effort of sending something like that back so it's kind of just like a marketing gimmick and i feel like rebates a lot of time are very similar yeah yeah and then, um kind of tying to this was would be like warranty registrations and i was thinking of this because uh, a recent friend of mine had uh, a problem with their uh the computer that they bought and you know they had bought extended warranty and everything and i was thinking like oh man like what if you what if you just um like missed out on registering your warranty or if you registered it too late or 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 what if your product broke like literally a day after the warrant you know the warranty uh expiration date but like typically you don't really know exactly when the expiry date is you know after a year or two down the line so I was thinking it would be great to have something, again, publicly available, accessible, that you can go in, you can see when things actually expire. And then if there is an argument with the manufacturer in terms of like the warranty coverage, um, it's kind of like a third party system that can help just um, resolve any disputes as to like the coverage period at least. Mm -hmm. So 
like this um, times DCR time and open timestamps, which is what DCR time is based on. A lot of their like first early use cases has to do with um, just supply chain management and just uh, like when, especially when diff uh, multiple countries are involved, international companies, you know, it becomes very hard to uh, establish like this chain of trust throughout the an entire supply chain of certain things such as diamonds and stuff. And so, um, yeah, th these time stamping blockchain time stamping applications are going to be pretty cool. And I'm interested to see what people come up with in the Polydia challenge. I think it will be a good one. Yeah, me too. I'm super excited. Uh, I I can't wait to, uh, for those guys to head down to Texas and uh, and see what comes out of the, the challenge in the hackathon. Yeah, so they actually pushed the date back till the end of January, so we'll have to wait a little bit longer, but it still should be a good competition with good results. So moving on to our next topic, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about cent having centralized social media accounts in decentralized projects. Um, and what I mean by that is having like official Decred social media accounts, whether that's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, um, and all of the top, all of the, like the biggest projects have them, with the exception of Bitcoin. But they do come with you know some cha challenges and potential pitfalls, right? If these these accounts are these centralized services, so that means that somebody has to be managing them, you know, or a group of people. And what if one person decides to go rogue one night, change the password, locks everybody out of the accounts, and then just you know starts hijacking the account, pushing out false or incorrect information, like there's a lot of potential to do a whole bunch of damage in that in that situation. What are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, that, that's a tough one to to solve because um, yeah, all of those uh, platforms, they're, they're typically tied to an email account of some kind. And I guess uh, as an administrator of that account, um, you know, how do you how do you ha handle like the ha handing off process if you're no longer managing it, or, or, or like you said, if someone hijacks the account and you know just decides to take it over for some reason or, or do whatever? Like, how do you, you know, and if they have the email access and stuff, so how do you resolve that issue? You know, I, I don't know. Like, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, like, you know, what if like, uh, what if like the the accounts, the official accounts, were tied to like. Uh, you know, like for in Decred's situation, let's say let's say Facebook social media platform was tied to like Facebook at Decred.org, right? And therefore, whoever is managing or supporting the Facebook channel, you know, they could do it to that account. Like, what do you think? What do you think of that? Yeah, I think that that is a pretty good idea. But I think that also, I think hijacking an account. It will, could cause a lot of short-term damage, but that ultimately could get resolved. I think one of the harder issues going, um, like moving down the road a little bit, is going to be as the Decred ecosystem evolves and gets bigger, we're going to have more and more community-driven projects. And so, who decides which projects get exposure through the official Decred um, social media accounts? Right, like this is somewhat of a hard problem. Pro problem because one, how do you do we have minimum requirements that a project has to meet to even be like considered to be tweeted on the Decred Twitter account? Or like, how do you make sure that you're you're being fair and you're not being biased to um, competitors? Like a good example is the two ASIC teams that are competing right now. Right. Like, we want to be as fair and unbiased as possible, but you know, ultimately, it's it's one person is probably going to have a little advantage over the other and like you're never going to be able to make it exactly even so i think this is going to be one of the problems that we struggle with as we get bigger and bigger and bigger what do you what are your thoughts on this do you see any potential solutions well to be honest not yet uh, i'll have to take a closer look to, to see what what could be done um, because it seems like to me that there would have to be I mean, you could possibly build some kind of process around it to ensure that you know this hijacking or this fairness and stuff. But at the same time, you don't want to build too much process so that it bogs down, like, or creates such a long, like, like bureaucratic you know, runtime for you to launch any kind of like campaign. You know what I mean? If you have to go through all of these checks and balances. But I do think, like, when you were um, mentioning like proposals, um, yeah, there should be at least some kind of like maybe standard. Uh, uh, like some kind of bar that all proposals should at least achieve, you know, answering certain kinds of questions and stuff so that they can be considered. So, you know, if there is some kind of either standardization or some kind of like 
foundation as to what is expected in a proposal mm -hmm. you know so you, you know you answer like what do you want to do like maybe why you want to do it and like what is your what is the expected outcome or benefit of this and that can kind of help streamline people who are like getting involved in like reading these and, and voting on them um and hopefully um sets sets up that idea or that proposal up for success right if all those i you know if all those details are kind of outlined um yeah yeah definitely and there actually is like um kind of like minimum requirements the proposal has to meet like there there's going to be a human uh, element to the proposal system where there will be decred contractors filtering out the proposals that don't meet minimum requirements and that's where the censorship tokens come into play if you get filtered out before the stakeholders have a chance to vote on you then you will receive a censorship token so that if your proposal truly is legitimate um, and not you know just spam then you can go to the community and be like this is my proposal this is my censorship token this is why i think it shouldn't have been you know, censored and the community can have a discussion. So we, they are putting in place those those checks and balances for the proposal system for that and those minimum requirements, which I think is good. So we'll probably, you know, as time goes on, we'll probably just have to develop similar minimum requirements for, you know, getting exposure on the official Decred social media accounts. Mm -hmm. But I think you, there's also a different side of the argument of, you know, Decred shouldn't have official social media accounts. We're a decentralized project. We're, we're you know, trying to become this, decentralized organization. So why do we have to have official channels? You know, Bitcoin doesn't have any official channels. Um, what would you say to somebody who who brought that argument forth? Yeah, um, I think it's got some validity. I mean, you know, it will definitely solve the problem of like, how do you manage official channels? But, but um, there's also a, the problem of like, um, if I was a, a brand new user and just introduced, let's say Decred, and I want to find out, you know, like real legitimate information ab about it, um, and there's, there's all these different resources all controlled independently, you know, how do I filter through the noise? How do I know what's what's real, what's not, you know? Um, you know, and, you know, just keeping, you know, like for me, I'm, you know, fairly technical, technically savvy. I can probably dive in there and figure it out, but I'm just like the average person that, you know, doesn't have the time to spend, you know, filtering through all that noise. How how do they figure things out? So I can see that being a challenge. You know, exactly. Um, so that is that is the big value of having these, you know, official channels of information. Is that newcomers who don't know much about Decred, they want a place where they can go. You know, where they it's an official knowledge source, so they don't have to filter through what could be FUD or could be biased information. I mean, I guess anything we put out will probably be biased for Decred, but um, <laughs> they, they still want a, an official channel of information. But then this brings it a whole new set of problems because, um, like for example, with Roger Ver owning Bitcoin.com. So for those not familiar, Roger Ver was an early Bitcoin adopter. He purchased the domain name Bitcoin.com, but now he's one of the the driving forces behind Bitcoin Cash, and he uses that Bitcoin Com domain to now uh, essentially push those those newcomers from Bitcoin into Bitcoin Cash and to promote Bitcoin Cash. And so, if you don't have these official channels, you open up the potential for attacks like that of competitors to go in and start, you know, official channels for you, and then spread misinformation. So it it's a difficult problem. Um, you know, it's only going to get worse as Decred keeps growing bigger and bigger. And it's just something the community is going to have to have discussions about, you know, so start thinking about it now and we'll have to, you know, hash out some some guidelines um, and minimum requirements at some point, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. I was just thinking like, um, I remember I was attending a meetup uh, recently and it was about security and we were kind of analyzing the differences between the fake my ether wallet and the real my ether wallet website and everything was absolutely 100 percent the same except for the url and, and the uh, ssl certificate so there's a lot of there's a lot of fraud and these guys are really really good at it so having official channels um i think it's, it is important absolutely i agree so at the end of the day there's definitely disadvantages but i think the the benefits outweigh the cons for right now so i'm in favor just have to figure out how to <laughs> best manage those yeah, exactly. Decentralized management of social media accounts. But all right, that, that's all the time we have today for the roundtable discussion. Um, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to the Decred YouTube channel. If you want to check us out on social media, our Twitter handle is at Decred Project. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Decred Project, on Reddit at rdecred, 
or come chat with us using our Slack replacement, which is Riot Chat. You can find a link in the show description to sign up. Until next time.